Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with the first part of mine and Hannah's recommendation series on underrated or underhyped books. So the first part of this project was our live show discussion that we did, so I will link that video down below, as well as the wonderful Hannah's book blog. She's amazing, you should definitely be following her. Um, and we are really excited to start recommending some of our favorite underhyped books. And we are doing this with different categories. Um, as we said before, you guys are welcome to join in. We would love to hear about some of your favorite underhyped books. I will also, of course, link Hannah's uh, blog post of recommendations down below. And our first category, and the one that we're doing today, is books that have less than 5,000 Goodreads ratings. And actually, I think all of these are quite a bit under that. All of these are under 3,000, and actually quite a few of these are under one or 2,000. So these are definitely underhyped books in the scheme of Goodreads ratings. Um, and believe it or not, I actually narrowed this list down quite a bit, and I still have a ton of books to talk about, so I'm going to try to be um, uncharacteristically concise when I'm talking about these. And I'm going to go from order of fewest Goodreads reviews up to highest number of Goodreads reviews, even though those are still not that many. The first book I have is Sing Sweet Nightingale by Erica Cameron. This is the first book in a fantasy, kind of contemporary fantasy series, um, and we follow two main characters, Mariella and Hudson. And Hudson witnessed um, the death of his little brother by this kind of like in-between sort of dreamland monster, and because of this he has dedicated his life to getting rid of these creatures or fighting them. And our other main character is Mariella, and she has actually been traveling to one of these dream worlds, um, and from pretty early on in the book we we know that something is weird about this, we know something is going on, um, but we don't know exactly what that is, and Mariella definitely doesn't know what that is. But it becomes clear that she's actually in a lot of danger, but she doesn't realize it. She sees this dream world as um, as like her home, as almost uh, paradise, and she loves spending time there, she loves spending time with the boy who lives there, and then he says to her that he has a way that she can stay there forever, but it will require a sacrifice from her. So the t these two characters' paths cross, um, Hudson realizes that Marielle is in danger, and she's she doesn't know it. I just really really love this book. Um, the character development and relationship development is wonderful. Um, I think the way this book handles themes of toxic relationships is just incredibly thoughtful. Um, I really loved the way that we got to see Marielle's relationship with her mother um, starting to change, and to get a little better. Also, I think I mention this scene every time I talk about this book, but it just sticks in my head so much. Um, and that is like, because it's a very classic, like for your own good type of like potential like love interest scene, but then it's subverted and handled in, I think, a much healthier way. Basically what happens is Mariella makes a mistake um, that could have been very dangerous for her. It could have really hurt her, possibly even led to her death. And Hudson gets really angry at her and he kind of yells at her. Um, and he tells her, he's like, how could you do this? Like, how could you make this mistake? Like, you have to be careful. And like, he leaves the room. And then a couple of minutes later, he comes back and he tells Mariella, he's like, I got angry because I was afraid for you, because I care about you and I don't want anything to happen to you. And like, I, I could have lost you. But he says, that was not an excuse for what I did. I shouldn't have treated you like that. I shouldn't have said those things to you. I'm sorry, that wasn't an excuse. And just like the communication there is really great. And I just like, I don't know, I, th I think that's just like a really great scene because it takes a kind of like overprotective, like romantic trope that is often portrayed in a really good way. And it kind of subverts it and it turns it into an opportunity for healthy communication. Um, I don't know, that's something that I just really loved. And I just really enjoyed seeing Hudson and Mariella's relationship develop, seeing them come to understand each other better and start to rely on each other and trust each other, especially because for various reasons, both of them kind of have a hard time trusting other people. And yeah, this is just a wonderful book. Also book two has an asexual main character and a lesbian main character. And I, the book is own voices for the asexual rap. Um, another cool thing is Erica Cameron on her website lists all the representation in her books. She believes it's important to share that information and she doesn't feel it should be a spoiler, which I think is really cool. So I will link her website down below as well. The second book on my list is We Are the Perfect Girl by Ariel Kaplan. That comes in at just 455 Goodreads ratings. And this was one of my favorite books of last year. This is a contemporary retelling of Cyrano de Bergerac. And I think maybe that's why, that's one of the reasons why this hasn't been as popular is because probably people think that you have to know that play. And trust me, you really don't. Like I have read and loved the play, and I appreciate how this book retells that play, but if you don't know that story, I think this book just reads as a really strong and thoughtful contemporary that has a beautiful balance of humor and deep topics and a little bit of romance and some friendship, and it's just like this book, I was not expecting it to be the kick in the chest that it was, but the way it deals with beauty standards and the way that we judge girls especially, like people in general, but girls especially based on their appearance and how when you do that, 
like everybody loses like even the people who are seen to fit those beauty standards um they're like those girls are put into boxes people assume they're stupid and i haven't even told you what the book is about so our main character is named afra and her best friend is bethany and bethany ends up getting a crush on the guy that afra actually likes but bethany doesn't know that and because of a series of circumstances afra ends up helping bethany this guy um which is obviously a really not fun thing for her to do because she likes this guy too and as you can probably predict um things get really messy and complicated because afra is getting to know this boy greg better um and bethany is starting to like him too but he thinks he's talking to bethany when he's actually talking to afra and it's it's very like believably messy i think even though some of the circumstances are like not things that would happen in a lot of situations um and another thing i think this book does really well is i think it handles the like secret issues very well because part of this book like part of the reason that this situation ends up happening is because afra does something that is not great um like basically she knows that greg thinks she's somebody else and she keeps talking to him and i think the way this book does that well is it doesn't let her like off the hook completely or anything but you kind of see why she made the decision in the moment and like you can understand it even if you don't condone it um and you still care about afra enough to want to see things turn out okay for her like she's not like irredeemable you know um and also this book has a great portrayal of therapy like just i can't say enough wonderful things about this book i think more people need to read it it has a wonderful friendship a wonderful hint of romance the themes this book covers are just so thoughtfully done um the dialogue is brilliant like it's so clever and funny and also really real yeah can't say enough good things about it i am taking way too much time on all these books already the third book on my list has 500 goodreads ratings and that is the bone garden by heather kastner this is a kind of spooky middle grade book and our main character is a girl named Ariel, um and she has been kind of created by this witch um out of ingredients basically and this woman miss vesper is always threatening Ariel that like if she displeases her or if she doesn't do her chores um she could like unmake her like that she's nothing basically she's not a real person and she could just like get rid of her um so miss vesper is obviously terrible and the book is about uriel deciding to find out more about who she is like if she is a real person and if she is like what what is her personality like who is she what is she like and along the way she ends up making some friends and this is just a really lovely atmospheric book with a little bit of creepiness um and some wonderful friendships and the themes in this book about accepting and loving yourself um about friendship again are just so beautifully done it's quite short i thought the writing was really good the way it like set the atmosphere and the setting um and the character development is also really wonderful and just you feel so much from ariel right from the beginning and i just really loved her i loved her friends and i just think this is a really great underhyped middle grade number four with 514 goodreads ratings is the enchanted sonata by heather dixon walwork i have talked about this book a few times um i have read it two years in a row on christmas but i think this is a wonderful book even if you don't read it at that time of year um this is a nutcracker retelling and it's also inspired a little bit by the fairy tale of the pied piper um and i just love this book so much so our main character is clara and she ends up getting transported into this um fantasy world called i think imperia which is essentially the world of the nutcracker it's kind of like russian inspired um and her and the nutcracker end up having to team up to try and defeat this pied piper character meanwhile back at home clara is worried about missing her uh, i think piano recital um and she's also desperately in love with one of her music tutors so she's kind of torn between wanting to go back home to what she knows and also being enchanted by this magical world and feeling like she has an obligation to help like i just thought that tension in her character was explored really well um i love clara and the nutcracker as characters like their interactions are so good the writing of this book is so wonderful um there are some beautiful lines and descriptions but it's also really funny and clever and like there's there's like so many scenes in this book that are just so funny or so like warm and engaging the relationships in this book are also wonderful there's a main romance and a side romance that are both beautiful i just adore them and the way that music is used in this book i think is also wonderful um i'm pretty picky about how music is used in books but i love the way it was done here um and the way it's kind of used as magic i just think that was really creative and really fun um yeah i love this book number five with 688 goodreads ratings is midsummer's mayhem by rajani la roca now this was also uh, on my favorite books of the year list and i've also recommended it a couple of times before um this is a middle grade retelling of a midsummer night's dream with an indian american main character named mimi and again i love it that's why it's on this list so mimi likes to bake um and she ends up entering a baking competition but she starts noticing that her foods have strange properties um her family starts acting weird her friends start acting weird uh if you've read or are familiar with midsummer night's dream you can guess at some of the relationship shenanigans that start happening and this is just such a fun and sweet book and i feel like this is one of those middle grades that is a ton of fun and it's not like 
about a serious topic, but there are little bits of serious things that are kind of sprinkled throughout. Um, like we see Mimi dealing with the loss of a friend who has moved away. Um, just like friendship in general is a really important theme. Family is definitely an important theme and especially like being a sibling and how that affects how you see yourself and see like your family as a whole. Um, this idea of feeling like you need to be you need to have like your thing, you need to have like a special talent when you have siblings, uh, like you need to differentiate yourself basically from your siblings and like not like in a negative way, like Mimi obviously loves her family very much but those things do come up. I love the baking and the magic in this book and this is just like such a sweet and heartwarming and cozy kind of book and I just love it. I think more people should read it. I'll try to remember to list content warnings for all, the, all these books down below, at least the ones that I can remember because some of these I read quite a while ago um, but I do want to mention for this one that like just there's a lot of obviously discussion about food and specifically about overreading at some points so be aware of that going in but this is just such a delight of a book. Number six is Lifestyles of Gods and Monsters by Emily Roberson and that one has 744 Goodreads ratings. By the way this is at the time like the day before filming this is when I took these notes so these numbers should be pretty accurate um, and I actually have a whole spoiler free review on this book so I'll try to keep this one brief. We'll see. This is a book with like such a strong and interesting concept that I'm pretty surprised I don't hear more about this book um, and that's because this is basically Greek mythology mythology meets uh, reality TV. Specifically this is a retelling of the story of Ariadne and the Minotaur, um, or Ariadne and the Labyrinth, I forget what it's actually called. Ariadne and Theseus? Anyway, so it's that plus reality TV um, and I feel like this is a retelling, like I don't watch reality TV, I don't really know much about it and I was still able to really enjoy this book. Um, I think this is one of those where like if you do have background knowledge, like I do kind of know the story of Ariadne and Theseus and everything, um, so I think there are probably things that I picked up on, like little things, and I think if you know reality TV really well you might be able to pick up on things that I didn't, but as a story I think it still works separately which is really great. And I did not expect this book to have such a strong effect on me, like I thought it would be fun and interesting, and it was, but it actually dealt with a lot of really serious and in some cases very dark themes, like sexual harassment or assault is dealt with, alcohol abuse, misogyny and sexism, and like the commodification of women's bodies is also touched on. Um, there's this one scene in particular where Ariadne, because she's, she's got this very like not like other girls mentality at the beginning of the book, which you guys know I hate, um, but you see her develop out of that in a way that I think is so rewarding to read. Um, there's this really brilliant scene where Ariadne basically realizes that she has been writing off her sisters, um, like that she has been doing to them the things that other people do to girls. I think it's a really great commentary on how we as girls are kind of taught to see each other as competition. Um, I do think that's starting to get better but it's definitely something that still happens and so I really appreciated seeing Ariadne like fight against that and try to develop past that. I was also surprised by how well the romance worked for me just because like it's a little bit quick but it makes sense why it was quick and I also found Theseus such an interesting character that I was kind of like, yeah Ariadne, I don't blame you for already being interested in him. I also think the themes of family were really really complex too um, and another thing that I think this book does really well is address responsibility um, and how being aware of something going on that's bad and not stopping it makes you part of it, like makes you part of the problem because um, Ariadne is forced to realize that and yeah like this book it went in some directions I didn't really expect and I just really really enjoyed it. Um, it's definitely very intense at times, like I said some of those themes are quite heavy um, so be aware of that going in, but I thought this was fantastic. I thought it did a really great job with like the fun premise and also the more serious underlying issues, um, plus some great character development, so really really enjoyed this one. Number seven is I Can Make This Promise by Christine Day and that has 1029 Goodreads reviews. This is a middle grade contemporary that is own voices for the Native American representation. Christine Day is a member of the Upper Skagit tribe and I believe that the main character Edie is also a member of that tribe. And this is an incredibly powerful book. Um, this is another one where I recommend checking out content warnings because it deals with a lot, um, especially regarding children or families, so please look into that if you need to. But this is about a young girl named Edie um, and her and her mother are both Native American and her mother was adopted when she was pretty young by a white family so like her mother has never really known a lot about her cultural background or about her family or anything like that and then one day Edie discovers a photograph in an attic of a girl who looks exactly like her, um, her meaning Edie the main character and that kind of starts this exploration of family secrets, um, things that her parents might be keeping from her and it's a story about grief and intergenerational trauma 
um, and trying to heal or trying to at least acknowledge the hurt. Another thing I think this book does really well is kind of balance the conflicts that are going on because while you have this really important story about um, Edie's family and about trauma and pain and all of this, um, she also has things she also has things going on with her friends and this book doesn't minimize the other pain that Edie is feeling. Like it doesn't feel like oh all of these friendship problems are you know minuscule in comparison to her learning about her family's past and everything. Like they both matter and obviously one of them is on a different scale than the other but the book never makes it feel like Edie is silly for being hurt by this and yeah I definitely think more people should read this one. I think I read it last year and I was super excited when Margaret picked it as part of the uh, Vault-a-thon for the round that was based on Brother Bear. Margaret asked for submissions of like books that we had enjoyed by Native American authors so I was super super happy when she picked this one. Um, yeah I just think more people need to read it. I'm starting to see a few more people talk about it but I still think it deserves more attention. Number eight has 1,309 Goodreads ratings and that is The Clergyman's Wife by Molly Greeley. Um, this is a really like quite short. I think it's about 300 pages. Actually less. It's like 200 and 70 something. So it's kind of like deceptive because it really really packs a punch. Um, this is a retelling of Pride and Prejudice that focuses on Charlotte Lucas and her life after the choice that she makes in Pride and Prejudice. And this was like such a quietly beautiful and kind of bittersweet book. Um, it's very satisfying to read though. It's not like the kind of bittersweet where you finish it and you feel drained. And another thing this book did is it made me understand Charlotte Lucas better as a character because I've talked about this before but Charlotte has always been one of those characters where like intellectually I can understand why she did what she did but on a like I don't know emotional level I just I just can't get it. Like I would never make the choice she did and I find it hard to believe how anybody could and this book made me understand her a little better. The themes in this book are wonderful like this idea that everybody has a story and everybody has a like like everyone has dreams and like this rich inner life and like the fact that Charlotte Lucas who in Pride and Prejudice is definitely not somebody that you would think of as a main character the fact that she gets her own novel is like I just think that's really cool and I think that that kind of feeds into this theme of the book that like everybody is important and that little actions matter, um, small kindnesses matter. I think the relationships in this book are developed in such a complex way. Yeah, I don't know if I'm describing this very well but this is just a really beautiful book that I'm really glad I read. Um, again like a lot of the themes just really speak to me and I'm really glad that I appreciate Charlotte more now. I have heard like almost nobody talk about this and I think this is one of the most skillful um, Jane Austen inspired books that I have read probably ever. Number nine has 1,356 Goodreads ratings and that is The Wendy by Erin Michelle Skye and Stephen Brown. I actually have a book two with me which is The Navigator um, and I have talked about this series before. This is a Peter Pan retelling that features Wendy as the main character and I think this is actually an indie published series um, which kind of is part of the reason why I think a lot of people haven't heard of it but I think this is so so well done. So the first book we follow Wendy as our main character and she's one of the first women or possibly the first woman to be admitted to um, I think like the British, is it the Navy maybe? And they have like a special division that is essentially to deal with like magic and like supernatural threats because in this kind of alternate history world um, Britain is facing a magical threat who everybody else seems to believe is coming from uh, the Lost Boys and Peter Pan and um, like Neverland and everything and Wendy is not so sure about that. She's not sure if that's exactly what's going on. So in the first book we are seeing her deal with a lot of the sexism that she has to face um, in such a male dominated field plus the time period that she's living in and we also see her getting to know Peter Pan better and like some of the other characters that we know from the original and I just think this is such a clever series. Um, I really love the writing. It's like this very kind of like whimsical tongue-in-cheek a little bit, very clever but like not over the top with how quirky and whimsical it is. Um, I love Wendy as a main character and I think when I read the first book I mentioned how like she's a character who I think could have very easily felt like a Mary Sue a little bit or like so perfect and just like everybody falls in love with her and all of that. Um, but it didn't bother me because I also loved Wendy. Like she's just, she's so good and she's so smart and caring and spunky. So even though she's one of those characters who like everybody loves her like right away, you kind of understand why. <laughs> um, speaking of which, I do want to mention that in this version, um, the characters named, is it John and Michael, I think, um, are not related to Wendy at all. Like in the original, they're her brothers and in the novel, there's characters who are not related to her who happen to have the same names as them. Just be aware of that going in because they are some of the characters who really like Wendy in a possibly romantic way. So just to be clear, they are not her brothers. Don't worry. I really like the way that the authors 
took inspiration from the original Peter Pan and they changed some things and they interpreted things in a creative way while still keeping some like core elements from the story. Like one of the things they changed that I think they did they made a good call on is the character of Tiger Lily. There's really not great indigenous representation as I think a lot of people know um, so I'm really glad that they took that in a different direction with this series and yeah I am really excited for the third book. I think that's coming out later this year. Um, and this is a series that I think if you are interested in retellings or you're interested in like alternate historical fiction with like a little bit of fantasy, um, I think you could really enjoy this series. Next I have Lalani of the Distant Sea by Erin Entrada Kelly and that has 1,549 Goodreads ratings and this is an own voices Filipino fantasy story. Um, our main character is of course Lalani and this one, um, I've mentioned before like I think some of the synopses give away a little more than I would have. What I'm gonna say is that Lalani um, lives in her village on this island that has been in a drought for a really long time and one day she gets the opportunity to make a wish to bring rain back to her island and things go a little bit wrong um, and so she ends up setting off on an adventure by herself to try and fix this and to try and save some people back home. Um, and this is just such an incredible adventure story. When you're on the island it's like this very like oppressive environment because it's supposed to be. Um, like the people who are in charge of this island are very controlling and not terribly nice. They're not really being good leaders for the people. There's also a lot of like suffering and grief because there's a sickness that people are catching on this island. And you also have Lalani just feeling like she's not enough. Um, like her best friend is this very brash and outgoing and outspoken girl who I also love. Um, and Lalani thinks because she's not like that, that that means she's not strong, that she's not brave. And throughout the book you see her realize that that's not true, that there are a lot of different ways to be brave and to be strong. And I just love her. Um, she's this, she's got this very quiet determination and bravery that I just admire so much. And through her journey you also start exploring themes about um, grief and forgiveness and revenge and specifically like what the best way to honor people who have been hurt that you care about is. Um, like if you should seek revenge on their behalf or if you should kind of like forgive and like work to move past it. The world building is fantastic. Uh, throughout the book we get like little snippets of kind of folk tales, um, some of them, some of which are quite creepy, that really help set this atmosphere and like this magical world and these magical creatures. Um, I just think this is a fantastic middle grade fantasy book and I think a lot of people would enjoy this one. Next I have a series I talk about all the time and that is the Love Sugar Magic books. Um, the first book is A Dash of Trouble which has 1,680 ratings. I'm holding up the third book which is A Mixture of Mischief, um, but I love this series. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I always talk about this series, but it's own voices for the Mexican-American rap. Main character Leonora um, learns in the first book that her family has uh, baking magic abilities. The family relationships in this, in this series are so thoughtful and so well developed and I love the way that throughout the series you see Leo learning that she can go to her family for help, that she has this network of support and love that she can rely on. I think this is another series that deals with some really serious topics in the middle of this really fun and exciting magical story. Like this series deals with grief and loss. Like this last book deals a little bit with like uh, cultural appropriation, like a little bit with sexism and things like that because of the way that some people view um, Leonora and her family's magic versus like real magic or something like that. Like Leo develops so much as a character. I love the friendships that she has and I just, I just love so many things about this series and if you haven't already picked it up, please pick it up. I am gonna keep talking about it until people do. Next I have a book that has 1,709 Goodreads ratings and that is An Assassin's Guide to Love and Treason by Virginia Baker. This is another one I talked about recently in my Shakespeare recommendations, um, but this is a historical fiction book and we follow two main characters. One of them is Lady Catherine, I think, and the other one is Toby. This is set in Elizabethan England at the time when the violence between Catholics and Protestants with that is height. You could be imprisoned or executed if you were discovered to be a Catholic. Our main character Catherine, um, her father was actually killed in a raid on their home uh, for being Catholic and she decided that to get revenge for that she's going to join this group of people who are trying to overthrow the Queen and to do that she has to disguise herself as a boy and become a part of this play troupe um, that is going to perform for the Queen. So she disguises herself as a boy and she gets cast in a production of Twelfth Night. The Twelfth Night is actually being directed by Shakespeare um, and Toby, our other character, he is actually a spy for the opposite side. So like on the side of the Queen. So they're on opposite sides. Neither of them know who the other one is and they're also working on this play together. And just this book is just so wonderful and so underhyped. Toby and Catherine, or a kit as she is known when she's dressed as a boy, um, are fantastic characters. Um, Toby is also bisexual and the way that was explored in this time period I think was done in a really thoughtful way. I think the way Virginia Baker conveyed a sense of time and place, like the setting was done brilliantly, like you really felt the tension, like the danger that these characters were in all the time, like the danger these characters were in if they were discovered, especially Catherine. The relationship was done so well, like it is 
a combination of slow burn and working on a play together so the tension is just great i think the actual plot is done really well too it's really exciting and intense and just overall the book i think does a great job of balancing the seriousness like the high stakes of what is going on with the fun or like romantic or funny or clever moments um like there's a good balance of serious stuff and light stuff and this is just a fantastic book and i think more people need to read it and as a lover of shakespeare it added an extra level of joy for me <laughs> next i have a book with 2208 goodreads ratings and that is very degree deep by Frances harding of course i had to include a Frances harding book on this list because i think she is one of the most underhyped authors so this is a contemporary fantasy book i think um, I, I think that's how you would categorize it. We follow our main character Ryan and his friends um, and there's this old well near where they live and one day they take coins out of it um, and this book is about what happens after they do that and they quickly realize that they made a terrible mistake when they did this and that now they kind of owe the well spirit um, something and this book gets like really creepy at parts. Frances Harding's books generally tend to be middle grade like YA crossover which I know people don't always think of as having the potential to be like that creepy or scary but I think this book was like I'm definitely a scaredy cat but this was the kind of creepiness that I could handle mostly um there's there's like this one scene I'm thinking of that I think about a lot um that is so creepy and just so like like visceral like the reaction to it that I had that I still think about. So um, yeah, just because this is marketed towards younger readers does not mean that it can't be kind of spooky and creepy. Um, but besides that, I just love this story. Um, Frances Harding is an incredible writer. Like the way that she does dialogue and descriptions and she doesn't waste words, but she's got this kind of a little bit of whimsy and a little bit of darkness and just combined with really clever dialogue and language. And I just adore her. I think the craft of her writing is so brilliant. Um, I think she's great at developing characters, um, not just the main characters, but just the entire cast. And I think the way that she writes middle grade books where the adults still feel like fully fleshed out characters, um, and the children do too, like none of them are like stereotyped or just there to like move the plot along. I think the mystery or plot of this book is really, really engaging. Um, the ending of this book is fantastic. And I just, I just think this one deserves more attention. Um, I think her books in general deserve more attention. Next I have House of Gold by Natasha Solomons and this book has 2,245 Goodreads ratings. Um, and this one you haven't actually heard me talk about at all because I haven't filmed the wrap-up yet. This is a World War One historical fiction novel. And we follow a Jewish family who, and the Jewish representation is own voices as well. Um, and we follow several main characters but I think kind of one of the main main characters is a woman named Greta and it's kind of like a business merger sort of situation. She gets put into an arranged marriage with with a like distant cousin or something from another branch of the family. They're like very distantly related so it's not like creepy and gross or anything. And so the book is about Greta and her new husband and how neither of them really wanted this but slowly they start getting to know each other more and actually enjoying each other's company. And then World War One starts and we see how that really affects this family and just the wider effects that World War One has on various families and countries um, and obviously just the world in general. And I just thought this book was incredibly compelling. Um, I was shocked at how invested I was in Greta and her husband Albert's relationship because I was not sure I was not sure I was going to be on board at the beginning, um, but I ended up being very invested in what happened to them and wanting them to be happy. This book also deals a lot with anti-Semitism, so be aware of that going in. And I think the way this book does that is really important because Greta's family is very well off um, and we still see how they're not safe from anti-Semitism and from prejudice and discrimination and how in fact the bigotry of people who are anti-Semitic because it is based on this false and ridiculous idea that Jewish people are like controlling governments and things like that and like they're too wealthy and all of this um, because it is a kind of discrimination that is based on the oppressed group doing well. Um, we see how even though Greta and her family are wealthy and are well off and are generally well respected in the community, they're not safe from this and in fact we see how small-minded people actually take this as confirmation um, of their prejudices. I also think Natasha Solomons is just a really brilliant writer. Um, like right from the beginning I just really enjoyed the way that she constructs sentences and the way she builds scenery, like the way that she introduces you to characters. I just like think this was a fantastic historical fiction novel and I haven't really heard anyone talk about it. We're getting near the end guys, I promise. Uh, next on my list is Noteworthy by Riley Redgate and that has 2,599 ratings on Goodreads. Um, this is a contemporary I read I think last year maybe and it's one of my favorites. Um, our main character is I think Jordan Sun is her name um, and she's at a performing arts high school I think it is, maybe college. 
it's been a while since I read this. Um, and she's an alto. And if you guys are in music or like know about singing, um, you know that there's not a lot of parts for altos. And she does not make one of the highly competitive girls groups at her school. So she decides, since she's a very, very low alto, she's like, what do I have to lose? I'm going to audition for the boys acapella group. And she gets in. And so the rest of the book is about her trying to like um, conceal her identity from people. Um, it's about her getting to know the boys in this group and making friends with them. Jordan is coming to terms with the fact that she is bisexual. It's not like a huge part of the plot or anything, but we do see that. Um, and it's just treated as like something that she realizes about herself. Another thing I love about this book uh, is that even though it has the like classic girl dresses up as boy plot, the book explicitly draws a contrast between what Jordan does where she like dresses up as a boy every day to go to this acapella group um, and the way that trans people live. There's like one or two scenes where Jordan like specifically realizes that what she's doing is different. I just thought the way that was acknowledged and discussed was really thoughtful um, and it's not something we see a lot with these cross-dressing storylines. We also have a little bit of romance in this book and I was shocked at how much I liked the romance because when I first found out or realized who the love interest was going to be, I was kind of like, oh, okay, that's fine. Like, he's okay. But by the end of the book, I was like very invested. Like, I really, really liked their romance. I thought it was super cute. The themes of friendship in this book are just wonderful. Um, I really loved the performing arts high school setting. Um, I also really liked the writing. I just think this is a really underrated contemporary, so I think more people should read it. And finally, the last book or series I'm going to talk about today uh, has 2,619 Goodreads ratings for the first book. And that is the Time series by Megan Morrison. This is Grounded, The Adventures of Rapunzel, and books two and three have even fewer ratings. Um, I also have a spoiler-free review for this series. It's one of my favorite series, so I will try to keep this brief again. Famous last words. This is a series of fairy tale retellings that I absolutely adore. Um, this is another series that I think balances the fun and light elements with the really serious topics it deals with. Um, and I think, like, I think a lot of people give up on this first book partway through because Rapunzel, as the main character, starts out very naive and very frustrating at times and very sheltered, which makes sense because she has grown up, you know, in a tower. But that sets the stage for some really, really beautiful character development in the rest of the book. And also as you go further in this book and in the series overall, you see that you see kind of like the darker side of this really like light and cute fairy tale world. Um, like this series really looks at, I think, consequences for things that we take for granted in fairy, fairy tales and fantasy books. Like the second book, one of the things that that book deals with is sweatshop labor um, and like unsafe working conditions. And it kind of makes you think about like, okay, so all these princesses wearing these gorgeous ball gowns, um, what about the people who actually have to stay up all night making those and things like that? Um, this book deals with toxic relationships. The third book deals with uh, government and like representative government in particular. There's also kind of a murder mystery subplot in the third book that I thought was really well done. It also deals a little bit with the sickness outbreak, so keep that in mind as we're still battling COVID-19. I hope everybody is still staying home if at all possible. Wear your mask, wash your hands, six feet of distance, please be safe. So each book is a companion book and it follows a different main character. They do all connect, um, so I would recommend reading these in publication order. Again, check out my full review for this series if you want more of my thoughts, but I, I just adore these books so much. I think they're so thoughtful and brilliant um, and clever and just fun to read too. They are tragically underhyped and I'm doing my best to change that. Okay, everybody, so those are some books I love that I think are very underhyped and that are all under 5,000 Goodreads ratings. Um, I know it was a lot. I know this video is going to be probably way longer than I wanted it to be. I will try to be more concise in the other videos, but no promises. We all know that underhyped books is one of my favorite topics, and I just get so excited when it comes to discussing them. Please let me know if you have read any of these books, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick any of them up. Um, I hope that you do pick some of them up, because obviously I think these books are all wonderful. Um, and ones that I want more people to love. And also comment down below and let me know one of your favorite underhyped books that doesn't have very many Goodreads ratings. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!